Hello, welcome to part two of Texas Folk Life's Apprenticeships in the Folk Arts Virtual Showcase. I'm Pete Brighthop, the program coordinator for Texas Folk Life's Apprenticeships in the Folk and Traditional Arts program. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Since 1987, the apprenticeship program has supported the training of hundreds of folk and traditional artists throughout the state of Texas. And um, because Taylor Swift's surprise album drop a few weeks ago um, named Folklore, there has been a big interest um, among folks in trying to learn about folklore. What, what is folklore? What are the traditional arts? Um, you know, what are these things that the apprenticeship program has been supporting since 19, uh, 1987? Well, hopefully can give you an idea of what some of these um, arts and practices are this evening. But as a quick primer here, the folk and traditional arts uh, comprise a variety of art forms that are practiced by a community or group of people who often share cultural values uh, and or heritage. Uh, these artistic traditions are typically passed on from one generation to the next or from one community member to another through extended periods of observation, demonstration, conversation, and of course, practice. And this is a learning model that's supported by our apprenticeship program as it provides funds and resources for a period of intensive learning and exchange between outstanding master artists and apprentices. And at the end of the program cycle, um, the artist teams, as we like to call them, showcase the results of their training together in public presentations. And these final public presentations typically, typically take place in spaces important to the respective communities of the artist teams, thus encouraging the transmission and learning of traditional arts. This year, however, the COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically affected the final showcase plans of each artist team, as countless public arts events have been postponed or canceled. Negotiating these unexpected challenges, Texas Folk Life has worked with select artist teams from this year's cohort to present our first ever Apprenticeships in the Folk Arts virtual showcase. So taking off of uh, taking off from last Thursday's presentations, uh, where we had presenters present on Chinese silk bamboo ensemble music, custom boot making, and Ghanaian dance, tonight um, from hand weaving, South Indian Carnatic vocal music to um, quilting, we have another very exciting lineup for you. And by bringing an array of folk and traditional artists from te uh, across Texas together, these virtual events are an opportunity not only to highlight each showcasing artist's hard work, but a chance to inspire exchange and create connections between diverse artistic communities. Communities that in a non-virtual world, so to speak, might not have as much of an opportunity to interact with one another. So in this spirit, we invite and encourage you all to participate as well. Um, we will reserve a couple minutes at the end of each presentation for questions. So while um, our artists are presenting, please write any question or comment you might have in the chat or the comments thread, um, and we will do our best to relay them to the artists. Without further ado, all right, I am thrilled to introduce our first presenter, Ms. Apprentice Carol Schuler, who is joined by her teacher, Midge Jackson, um, now in the role of assistant. <laughs> uh, Though she uh, had practiced as a fiber artist for nearly 20 years knitting, Carol, uh, prior to her apprenticeship, considered herself a novice when it came to weaving and spinning. Under Midge's guidance, Carol quickly grasped the foundational mechanics of weaving and subsequently explored a variety of approaches to patterning and design. Having transformed the second floor of her home in Tyler, Texas into a bona fide gallery, Carol will demonstrate some of these techniques and share pieces from the impress impressive range of work she completed with Midge over the course of her apprenticeship. Welcome, Carol and Midge. Thanks, Pete. And I'm fortunate tonight that Midge is able to help me as my camera person. And we're going to figure out a way to get her some screen time, too, so that everybody can see her. Um, but my apprenticeship did focus on weaving. Midge has about 10 years of uh, weaving experience and training. And my weaving experience was pretty basic knowledge. So when we first got together, Midge had uh, a list of things that she was anxious to teach an apprentice and I had a list of things that I really wanted to learn. So we sat down, compared our lists of what we wanted to do, and we decided to focus on pretty much three areas. And the first areas were, was the really the basics of weaving on a loom, from planning your project to executing the project and then taking it off the loom and finishing it. Um, 
We also wanted to focus on weaving using a variety of patterns. And we wanted to also weave using a variety of looms. So weaving is creating fabric by taking threads, which are called a warp or weft, and you take them over and under and over and under a set of stationary threads that are called, that's called a warp. It's kind of like when you were a kid and you made those pot holders on those pot holder looms and you had the little plastic triangle and you had the loops that were stationary and you took the other loops and went over and under and over and under. And this pattern that you created is called a plain weave when you took those pot holders off. Um, but varying the warp threads that you take it through will also uh, determine different patterns that you can create in your fabric. So I'm going to kind of walk through some common stages of a weaving project. And then we're going to insert in here a series of videos that show the process we went through. So of course, the first part in a weaving project is your planning. You want to figure out what is it that I want to weave? Do I want to weave a table runner? Do I want to weave a dish towel? Um, do I want to weave fabric that I can later take and make into a garment? So after you've determined that, then you want to know the dimensions of what you're going to weave. And then you want to select your fiber. You want to select your fiber appropriate to the type of project that you're doing. So if you're doing a dish towel, you probably wouldn't want to do a, a wool type yarn with it. You want to have something that's absorbent and soft. And also um, you want to plan the, how much fiber that you need. So your dimensions come and help there. And then last, you want to figure out what kind of a weave structure do you want? Do you want the plain weave like we talked about with the pot holders? Maybe you want a pattern, like a lot of people are familiar with twill fabric, or you want to maybe look at color. Do you want stripes in there? Do you want different colors for your warp and your weft? So those are all factors that come into planning your project. Um, the next step that you would do is winding your warp. And uh, we've got a short video talking about winding the warp. So if you could go ahead and play that now, please. Okay, so the first step in your project is to wind your warp. And we use a warping board for that. The warping board serves two purposes. First, it helps you measure the length of your warp, and it also helps you um, wind on the number of threads that you need for your warp. So a warping board from peg to peg is approximately one yard. So you can see we've got approximately three and a half yards wound onto this. Now there's um, ties here so that the warp stays together when you take it off the warping board. But one of the things that's crucial is the cross. That's right here. And these threads are stacked on top of each other so that the threads stay in order when you take it to the loom and you're going to thread it through. Otherwise, um, it just becomes a big mess. And then also what you'll see here are the counting threads where we tied off each of the warp threads in groups of 20 so that we could count them as they're wound on. So after you've um, wound the warp, and use the ties, then you're ready to take it off the loom. And you take it off from the opposite end. And you chain it. And it just helps the warp to stay together before you get to the loom. And now we're taking it over to the loom. and we're gonna get ready to thread it through. Is it not here in the video? I'm not seeing it or hearing it either. We wouldn't see it on the video we have. Okay. Though.
Hey, Carol, your video just played. Um, I'm thinking because you're filming with your phone, you might not be able to see when your videos are playing. Yeah, we're not here in the audio for the video, so we may need a cue when it's... Um, yeah, I'll give you a rule. The cues are great, so you cue Ben, and then I'll cue you to start talking again after the videos. Okay, that sounds good. Thanks. Fantastic. Okay, so your next step is going to be warping the loom, and that's the process of threading the loom's reeds and huddles. Now the reed is the part that separates and spaces the warp threads and the heddles are attached to a shaft. And when you raise and you lower those shafts, um, that's how your weft threads go over and under the, the warp threads. So the next video is gonna show um, my floor loom and it's going to show after the reed and the heddles were threaded. So we're ready for that video. Okay, so now we're about to do the final stages of putting the warp on the loom. And the first video, we talked about the cross that we put on the, the warp to keep the threads in order. And here's the cross right here. We put a, a stick on either end and use that to put them in order as we put them through. This is the reed. And the reed is what keeps the threads spaced apart. And also when we start weaving, we're gonna actually use it to beat the weft as we put it through. So after we take it through the reed, then the next step is to put it through the heddles. And these are heddles, they um, determine the sequence of the threads. And they also will determine based on how you thread the heddles, will determine the pattern in your fabric. And each one of these heddles is attached to a shaft and how you raise the shaft or lower the shaft will create a space between the, the threads that are raised and the threads that are not raised. And when you throw the weft in there, that's how you get the over, under, over, under effect. Um, and also the order that you raise the shafts will also determine your pattern. So we're about to take, everything is threaded. It's tied onto the bat beam. We're gonna roll it on and we're ready to work. All right, we're ready to go. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna show after the warp is on the loom, we start weaving. So I'm gonna demonstrate actually throwing, this is a shuttle that has your weft threads on it. And I'm going to be raising shafts with, I've got foot pedals that I'm doing. and then I'm beating it with the reed. So that is the, um, the process of actually doing the weaving. And then when you get the project reaches its desired length, it's time to take it off of the loom. And so you're gonna cut your warp and take it off. And so the next two videos, are actually showing my table loom and what the project we're taking off the table loom is a project that you're gonna see later on. Um, the first video actually shows cutting the warp threads and the second video shows us tying bundles of the cut off warp threads in overhead knots just so we can keep the weft in place um, before we do our next step with the um, project. So we're ready for videos um, three and four. Go. So this is a project that we wove on a table loom um, and it is going to be the jacket that you're, that you're seeing in this um, showcase. So I've just finished, I've done the last throw of the shuttle through and we're about to cut it off and see how the fabric turned out. So. This is the moment of truth. So we've snipped the threads in the back and now we're going to pull all of the threads through the heddles and the reed and just tie them off into small bundles.
All right, we have cut and tied and we're off the loom. Yay. <laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna walk you through some of the projects that Midge and I worked on. And I'm gonna show the project that's on the loom right now. This is the project that you saw winding the warp and also warping the loom. Um, we're using a technique that's called overshot. And basically it's plain weave, but the way that the heddles are threaded, sometimes when I throw the shuttle, the warp is not catching the weft, so it overshoots the warp. So that overshot actually forms really pretty patterns. But if you were to take the patterns away, then you would just have plain weave. Um, this warp is out of cotton and the project is a checkerboard. And I don't know if you can see, here's the squares that are forming. And um, I'm excited about this because this is going to go to a house that's by the beach. So we're going to use seashells as the checkers. So I'm going to start showing some of our very first project that we did. This project was really good because I had woven in the past, but there had been a break. And so there were a lot of parts of the process that I had forgotten. And this process was really good. Um, good review for me. What we made are dish towels. Um, these dish towels are made out of cotton and linen. So once you wash them and throw them in the dryer, they're going to become very soft and very absorbent. Um, we used as our basis, uh, this is a hand woven magazine and you can see the towel that, that we used in there. So, um, this is still a plain weave, but it was a good exercise in using colors with it, not just one color, but we used color in the warp and we used a color in the wet. So this project um, was kind of a lengthy project. So we decided the next thing we would do would be um, more of a shorter project. And we wanted to use pre-woven scraps and also pre-woven belting to make something that was special and beautiful. So we made a book cover. This is a warp that was from the end. When you've, when you've done enough weaving to, to you've still got warp left on your loom, sometimes it's a good idea to play with what's left on the end. So you could play with like different colors and so you could play with throwing in a thicker yarn or a thinner yarn and just play with it. So that's essentially what this was. But we also got to do with it, um, we used iron-on interfacing that we used to secure the warp in the weft and so that we could cut it to the dimensions. So we surged it and then took it to the sewing machine and sewed these pockets and um, later came back and added embellishments on there. We also tried tapestry weaving, and this is sometimes called painting with yarn because you use techniques to make pictures. Um, this is also what we would call weft face because the weft completely hides the warp and you don't know it's there. Uh, this is a very simple loom and people have been using very simple looms for ages, especially if you didn't have a floral loom. Uh, so we've improvised using a picture frame. We saw little notches about a half an inch apart here and used a string for our warp and um, then wove the tapestry on the front. And our inspiration was we used a tapestry weaving book where you can weave a sample, a sampler. And so basically I just went step by step using scrap yarn that I had um, and followed each of the different patterns that were included in the book. Okay. So we decided to switch to a totally different loom and that is a triangle loom. And this is a shawl that was made. Triangle looms come in various widths you measure them from top nail to top nail across. They can be this wide. We used a three foot wide loom and we used a five foot wide loom, but you can see that 
here is the triangle. And this, you know, is different fiber. This is wool and silk. And this is actually some yarn that I spun that we used. So while it was still on the loom, we crocheted an edge around each triangle and then used that as the edge to sew it together. And this is actually a pattern that um, Midge had created that we used. So these are, um, they are five three foot triangles. And here is a blanket that is made from two five foot triangles that we sew together down the middle to create a square. And even on the triangle loom, you can do, this is plain weave, um, this is plain weave, but this, we did a twill pattern. So you can do different patterns too. So one of the things we have, these are two triangles that have just come off of a five foot loom that I'm going to sew together into a square for a blanket. Now we have a triangle loom set up here and I'm actually gonna demonstrate just doing a couple of uh, rounds across. One thing about a triangle loom is you do your warp and your weft at the same time. So you don't need to wind your warp ahead of time. But there's nails across the top and then down the sides. And use this looks kind of like a crochet hook. It's just a really long hook. And this will be easier to see when I get on the other side. But I'm going over, under, over, under. and pulling this down. I'm going to take it across the loom and it's going to become the next round of warp threads. And then over, under, over, under, over, under, over. and pull it across. And so you gradually fill in your weaving from the sides to the center. And as you do that, sometimes the threads aren't straight, so you, you have to do something to beat them. So you can just use a simple, this is just a hair pick that um, probably got at Walgreens or you know any kind of dime store and use that, so. And now we're going to show you our final piece, the one that we really wanted to make. We wanted to kind of make a, a bigger piece toward the end. So we decided we wanted to make a garment and it wanted to be something we wove the pieces and we cut them and we sewed them together. And so uh, what we did, Mitch suggested we use a twill pattern because twills are very drapey and so it'd be really good in a garment. And this book is a pretty good comprehensive book um, that weavers do is for a lot of different patterns. It's called the green book, but, well, because it's green. Um, but we were looking at, um, this is actually the pattern we used. And you know, part of the learning process with weaving, you'll see what looks like just a bunch of dots and lines here, but this is actually weaving charts. And so reading them, was part of what we learned too, because this tells you how to thread your heddles or what order to raise your shafts in. So with this one, we wanted to pick a pattern with, that with one warp, we could weave multiple patterns without having to change warps. So this is actually the one that we chose. And usually when you're doing a really big project, it's a good idea to weave a sample so I did do a sample using those three patterns. Um, I'm not sure if this is gonna be a scarf or a table runner, but it's a cotton warp with, um, I think this is just sock yarn, so it's probably got wool and um, nylon in it. 
to kind of learn. It helps you learn the traveling. It gives you an idea of what your finished project is going to look like so you can make any kind of adjustments you want to. So this was what we ended up doing as our final project. We um, wove the fabric for this jacket. And this is what you saw when we demonstrating cutting the uh, project off the loom. This is what we had. And I'll show you the back so you can see the patterns better. But this is a cotton warp and the yarn itself is cotton and silk and it's hand dyed. So I was really glad I got to use it to show it off in this project. But we wound on a longer warp and wove um, the individual pieces. So in between we put plain weave and we actually put like two strips of toilet paper in between so that we could cut in between the toilet paper and the plain weave helped hold what we had in place. And we came back with um, some iron on underlining and ironed that over the, uh, the edges and then cut it and sewed it together and made the jacket. So this is um, what we've done. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to allow us to showcase. This has been a great experience because it helped me to refresh skills that I had gotten very rusty on. But now I've also learned that there's a whole lot of other things that I can do with weaving and I can do more in, it in the future. So thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carol. Wonderful presentation. We have a question here sure. from Tony Silva. And Tony is asking, um, how much can I expect to spend on a looming setup? And I think he's referring to the floor loom. Um, and what, what's the maximum you should spend as a rookie? Oh, as a rookie. I think as a rookie, I would find um, somebody who's got to take lessons from or somebody that you can borrow their loom. It depends on if you buy your new or if you're able to find it used and, and sometimes you can find um, equipment at estate sales uh, we've got a weaving group and people post on there that they've got things that are for sale i would think as a beginner you may not want to start off with the floor loom because it is a pretty big cost investment i think i would go with maybe a table loom um and that could be anywhere from a couple of hundred dollars but if you're getting like you know it's like with anything the bigger you get or the fancier you get the more it's going to go so if you got a bit even a bigger floor loom you could be looking at maybe over a thousand dollars i think great um i have a question um somewhat related i'm really taken by this last piece and you were and you showed the the notation in the book how to kind of get different patterns from the same warp um i'm curious if you've experimented with tying together pieces used that have been created on different looms. So say you use a triangle loom and then you connect it to someone that you've built on, that you've crafted in the floor loom or a table loom, et cetera. Is that common or is that not? <laughs> I don't know why you could do that. I mean, I think you're limited by your imagination. I haven't seen it and we didn't do that. I don't know if Midge has done that. Have you done that Midge when you combined? No. Uh, but it would be pretty easy to do. You'd obviously have to weave your pieces separately and mm -hmm. then, but with an eye toward what your final product was going to be. So you would know you need to coordinate size and, and have a pretty good idea or picture in your mind of your end goal, but certainly you could do it. And see a lot of that would be in the planning process because when, you know, like we talked about it tonight, yeah. we just said, okay, planning it's steps one through five, but actually, planning is a pretty extensive project and we spent a lot of time with pencil and paper and calculator and um, just playing with different numbers, playing with different things. So planning is probably just about as critical as even just throwing the shuttle or cutting it off the loom. So you, if you spend a lot of time in your planning process, I think you'd be just limited by what your creativity was. You would indeed have to sample it and have some kind of knowledge of what the patterns are going to do because uh, patterns not only do you know give you a design it also gives you the movement the stretch and the otherwise the stability of your piece you'd have to be really good. it probably would be the first project and would you say um 
would the planning process sometimes even take better uh, take a longer time than the actual creation process? Meaning, like you you plan um, an idea, you maybe you, you sample it, um, you try it out, realize you want to tweak some things, you go back to the drawing board, then go again. Um, I'm just curious if you can speak a little bit more about that process. I think that's true because um, you can a lot of different numbers in a different scenarios. Um, what I found impossible before I started weaving is by the time that you get everything on the loom and you're ready to start throwing the shuttle, you probably have spent as much time, if not more time, just the planning and just the threading process. Well, and the sampling too. Sampling, yeah. Yeah, it, sampling's something that nobody wants to do. We wanna do our project and get it off the loom and be thrilled with it. But uh, eventually we all have to go back and sample because uh, it gets tiresome to fix all those mistakes. <laughs> so sampling's a big part of it, planning and then sampling. And uh, uh, it gives you an idea about the color and everything else in the sample. Then you know where you're going. Great. Um, thank you for that, both uh, Mitch and Carol, for that wonderful answer and presentation. I think, um, as Mitch said, I think you, Carol, are, can rightfully be thrilled with all of these pieces that you have created. I think they're they are wonderful. So thank you again for a, a great showcase. Thank you. Okay, um, next, I would like to introduce apprentice Srinity Kaushik uh, from Irving, Texas. Uh, currently a computer science student at the University of uh, Texas at Dallas. Srinity continues to dedicate her time to refining her skills as a South Indian Carnatic instrumentalist, vocalist, and uh, Bharatanatyam dancer. The apprenticeship program gave Srinity the opportunity to hold intensive one-on-one -on -one training sessions with her vocal teacher, Thanmayi Krishna Murthy. And Thanmayi, since her debut performance at the age of 11, has maintained an active teaching, recording, and performing career in India and the USA as one of the most sought after vocalists in the Carnatic tradition today. During her apprenticeship, Srinity focused primarily on developing her improvisation skills as a means to tackle ragam tanam palati. This is a highly virtuosic form of Carnotic singing that showcases the depth of the performer's skill and knowledge. Welcome, Srinity. Uh, thank you, Pete. Um, before I begin, I would just like to start by thanking Texas Folklife for this amazing opportunity. And um, I just want to talk about why I found this program so special. So I really like how this program kind of encourages you to learn about your art form in its traditional way. Um, in Carnatic music, the relationship between the guru, the teacher, and the student is more than just um, the teacher teaching the student some songs. It's more of a close relationship. And over time, the um, guru passes on what they know to the student. And so I really like how this program encourages you to learn in its traditional way. Um, with that being said, um, like Pete mentioned before, uh, my main focus for this program was um, to focus on my improvisational skills. And in doing that, I learned about a piece called the Ragam Thanam Balavi. Um, this is a piece that includes all the different improvisational aspects typically used in Carnatic music. And it's usually a single line composition. It can become more complicated if um, you include different ragams and different rhythmic structures. However, um, for the showcase, I will be kind of presenting a simple condensed version uh, to demonstrate the structure of the ragam dhanam balavi and to kind of showcase um, what I learned about how it's presented. So um, the ragam dhanam balavi is um, composed of three main parts, the ragam, thanam, and the pallavi. So the first portion I'll be presenting is the ragam, also known as the alapana. And this is an improvisation of phrases um, based on the notes uh, that the ragam is made up of. Uh, the ragam is similar to a scale. It's not exactly a scale, but very similar to um, a scale of notes. And so the alapana is an improvisation based on that scale. Ah, 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 ah,
the next question is called the Tanam, and this is very similar to the Ragam in that it's also an elaboration on the um, set of notes that make up the scale, but it's different in that um, it has somewhat of a rhythmic structure. So it's not set to a beat, but it does have some sort of rhythm and is also sung on the syllables Ananta, which translates to infinite. And the final portion is the Pallavi. Um, this is a single line composition. This specific composition was written by my guru, Tanmay Krishnamurti. It is set to a beat. It's set to the Thalam, Tishra uh, Tripurta Thalam, and is in the Ragam Hindol. Mm. Sāmhaka nadodhani Sāyadā shankarani Sāmhaka nadodhani Sāyadā shankarani Sāmhaka nadodhani Sayada Shankarani Samagan Nodhani Samagan Nodhani Sayada Shankarani
forgot to mention before but uh, within the Pallavi um, I also did two improvisation techniques so I did the first one was Nirval and that is where I took the basic structure of the Pallavi and I improvised using the lyrics of the composition and the second one was where I improvised using the soul flesh syllables so although the actual Pallavi was only one line um, it was extended through all these improvisation techniques and with that, I would just like to thank Texas Folk Life one more time for giving me this opportunity. Serenity, that was awesome. Thank you. That sounded great. Um, and kudos to you for doing that uh, as a solo performance. I mean, that can be <laughs> difficult um, and unnerving, uh, but fantastic. And so with that, we have a question um, from Jennifer Steverson, uh, a fellow cohort member of yours. And she's wondering uh, what instruments are used to accompany um, this music? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, so in Carnatic music concerts, um, I've, I don't think I've ever actually seen a solo vocal singer, but they're always accompanied by um, usually a mridangam, which is like a drum, and also a violin. Um, you can also have some other instruments like a gatam and more sing and everything, but um, the standard Carnatic concert usually includes the three vocal um, rhythm gum and the violinist. And how does that change for you as if you are singing, for instance, with, with an ensemble, how does that change your process when you're performing? Um, uh, well, so with the violin accompaniment, um, you usually, whenever you do improvisations, you always give room to both the violinist and the rhythm gum to sort of like finish it off. So, um, for example, when I was doing the Kalpana Swarams, which was the improvisation on the Soul Fledge, I would do one round, so like one Swaram, I guess, and then I would give room to the violinist to do one round. And it's kind of like a back and forth exchange. And then um, the Murdangam is always playing a beat, but the Murdangam will basically finish off the um, Sangatis and finish off each section. And is this interaction um, have worked out beforehand or does a lot of this um, kind of trading back and forth happen in the course of performance? Most of it is during the course of the performance. So a lot of Carnatic music is based off of improvisation. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of it will just come on the stage. Okay. So the violinist will be able to recognize sort of, you know, what form of improvisation you might be doing when your, when your phrase or section ends. So then that person can jump in and respond. Yeah, and a lot of, I mean, during the concert, you have, like, um, the interaction between the vocalist, the violinist, and the rhythm gum will also give, like, clues to the violinist, like, hey, this is your turn, kind of thing. Uh, great, and I'm, I'm sure you probably trade ideas back and forth, too, between them. Yeah, so yeah. another thing, like, with swarms, for example, um, the violinist will sometimes do swarms that will complement the vocalist, and the rhythm gum will play rhythms that complement the instrument and the vocalist. 
Um, great. And we have uh, another question here from Gabby Kane. Um, if she's wondering, uh, wants to learn a little bit more about the learning process. Um, so her question is, is she's curious about um, using sheet music or do you just learn solely from listening to um, your guru or Tanmayi in this, in this instance? Um, so I think most of the learning comes from listening a lot, um, especially for the improvisation. Like you just have to listen to a lot and be able to um, kind of listen and sing by sing by what you hear, I guess. Um, you can write notations for the compositions, but I think most of it is just um, comes from listening and um, like face to face teaching. And so this listening, I mean, you're listening to your teacher. Um first and foremost, but then are you also doing a lot of outside listening, listening to other great um, vocalists or other, you know, violinists, other other types of musicians? How does, I'm just kind of curious how you synthesize and all this information that you're listening to. No, definitely you listen to everyone, as like as many people as you can, because um, I think everyone has their own style. So it's really important that you listen to both your teacher and um, other great musicians. Um, especially like going and listening to concerts in person is a really cool experience. You can learn a lot from that, not just music wise. So it's really important that you listen to, I think, everyone. Uh, great, everyone. And then I'm, I'm also curious, we, we spoke a little bit about this in our, in our conversation a few months ago, um, but you know, I know that you have musical interests outside of the Carnotic tradition. So I'm curious if you can speak a little bit about how you might try and bring some of those other influences in, or if you haven't really tried to, to do those fusions yet, or? <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I also play the violin. Um, so I do like a lot of accompaniment for singers. So um, yeah, I, I don't know, it's, it's very similar. So I think learning vocal and violin isn't hard because they're very similar to each other. So a lot of the ideas are very similar. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great, awesome. Um, again, Srini, that was a fantastic performance and demonstration. We could talk about this uh, much, much longer because I know this this form of singing that you just presented is um, very difficult and a lot of intricate um, nuances um, that take a long time to, to, to develop as a singer. So again, congratulations on a fantastic performance. Thank you so much. And thank you for participating, yes. Great. Um, well, before introducing our final artist of the evening, I would like to take a second here to thank our sponsors. Texas Folklife's apprenticeship program is made possible uh, by a state partnership award for the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with the Texas Commission on the Arts and support from the board and members of Texas Folklife. Additional support is provided by the Cultural Arts Division of the City of Austin Economic Development Department. I would also like to take a, a second here to give a quick shout out to my predecessor here at Texas Folklife, Ian Halligan, um, as I just recently took over the helm as the apprenticeship program coordinator at the end of May. Ian was instrumental in reinvigorating the apprenticeship program in 2015 uh, and tirelessly continued to expand the program um, to what it is today. So I just wanted to, to thank Ian and to let him know that all of us at Texas Folklife are wishing him the best with his future endeavors. And if you, um, are interested yourself in applying for or would like to learn more uh, about the apprenticeship program, please contact me and Pete Brighthop at apprenticeships at texasfolklife.org or fill out the apprenticeship program interest form. And this is found on the Texas Folklife website. Um, you can look under featured articles, which is on the homepage. Application materials for the 2021 apprenticeship program will be available this fall. And please also consider supporting the apprenticeship program directly by making a tax deductible donation to Texas Folklife on Facebook by clicking the donate button on our page or visit texasfolklife.org. And for more dynamic folk and traditional arts programming and initiatives, you can again visit texasfolklife.org and also like and subscribe to our social media channels. Um, the YouTube channel has some fantastic uh, videos from previous apprenticeship. Uh, participants. So I encourage you to check that out. All right. Last but not least, uh, apprentice Jennifer Steverson will lead the final presentation of the evening. As an Austin-based textile artist, writer, and independent scholar, Jennifer's work focuses on, on focuses on unearthing, presenting, and artistically reimagining uh, narratives stemming from historically Black communities. 
Profoundly inspired by the G's Band quilt makers, a small remote black community in Alabama, Jennifer wanted to learn how to quilt to further integrate her artistic practice and historical research. Um, at a Texas folk life quilting exhibit held in 2019, Jennifer fortuitously met Tomasita Louvier Ligon, uh, who is the current president of the Austin Area Quilt Guild and a celebrated art quilter whose work is centered around telling stories for black American families and communities. With training from Tomasita, Jennifer has quickly begun to incorporate traditional and modern quilting techniques into her practice, which she will speak about tonight. Welcome, Jennifer. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, and um, I just wanted to thank um, the Texas Folklife um, Foundation for this opportunity. Um, it was really fantastic. Um, and I just really appreciated being able to work one-on-one -on -one, um, with um, such an experienced quilter. Um, it was really, uh, has transformed my artistic practice. So I appreciate the opportunity. Um, and so, um, like Pete mentioned, I first met my teacher, um, Tomasita, um, at a really wonderful show, quilting show that was at, that was shown at Texas Folk Life. And um, the show was quilts by African-American quilters um, and each quilt um, was interpreting one, um, one of the tenets of the United Nations um, Human Rights Declaration. And so um, it was really eye-opening to see um, how all of the quilters in the show were able to blend um, modern quilting, art quilting, and traditional quilting to tell really powerful stories um, about the importance of human rights. And so I have a presentation um, that I'd like to go through. So yes, this is it. So um, one of the things that I absolutely loved about, um, that I love about Tomasita's work and the way that she approached um, this apprenticeship as a teacher is that she was very focused on giving me a foundation of different skills that I could then use to, to kind of fit my own needs. And so, um, the way that the apprenticeship was designed is that um, first I began learning um, traditional quilting techniques and, that, and now I've begun to transition into learning modern and art quilting techniques. Um, and so if you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So um, this is a picture of me um, after my very first quilting lesson, um, which took place, um, it was actually my only in-person lesson, um, all of my lessons since February have been virtual, but um, we met in a quilting studio in North Austin and Tomasita um, handed me a binder with our curriculum um, and um, graph paper that I could use to begin designing quilts. And so the first um, technique that I was taught um, was nine patch. And so you can see, um, if you look at the picture of me kind of on my, <laughs> on my left, um, you can see kind of a checkerboard pattern and that's a classic nine patch. And so I was able to make um, a nine patch quilt um, that's actually the size of a baby quilt. So um, it's a smaller one, but this is a quilt that I've completed using nine patch and also using um, the churn dash. So the way that I created the nine patch quilt was to create um, strip sets, which is basically where I measured out um, two and a half inch strip wide um, pieces of fabric um, in alternating colors. I chose to work with blue um, and white for my first quilt. And I chose blue because it's one of my favorite colors to work with and also because I work with indigo. Um, I do natural dyeing and indigo is my primary medium. And so I really wanted to see how the different variations and shades of blue could be shown off um, using this very simple um, technique. And this is um, a this is a, a pattern that you that you do see in a lot of traditional quilts. And so in the quilt that I completed, um, which you can see on the right, um, at least as I'm looking at it, you can see that I was basically able to kind of take strip sets and the nine patch um, and the churn dash to create these different um, rail kind of borders around um, my two central um, blocks. And so I'm really proud of this quilt. I learned a lot making it. Um, it taught me the foundation. And the foundation with quilting, it's really interesting. It's not just about sewing. There's a lot that you have to do before you get to the sewing. So quilting is as much about ironing in the correct way. And it also is very much about 
um, how to cut correctly. So the tools that I used in my quilting apprenticeship um, included um, square rulers, different quilting rulers that I got. Um, I have a cutting mat and then I also use a rotary blade to make sure that all of my pieces are nice and even and that they're the same size. Um, and so once I had enough blocks to, to make this quilt, I then proceeded to piece together each block um, in rows. And then I connect, then I sewed the rows to each other and then I gave the entire quilt a border. And then once the border was on, then I began working on the binding, which is a solid navy blue binding. And that's what holds, they call it a quilt sandwich, but that's what holds the quilt sandwich together. So what you're seeing here um, is, you know, multiple layers. So there's the quilt top, which is the beautiful pattern that we all think about as a quilt. Then next you have the batting. Um, and then um, underneath the batting, you know, you have the, the back of the quilt. And in this case, I chose a solid piece of turquoise fabric just to kind of continue like the kind of watery theme because I used a lot of petite prints in my quilt top. Um, yes. And then the churn dash is one of my favorite blocks. It's a combination of strip sets and then um, also of half square triangles. And it creates almost like a little bit of a, of a windmill effect. Um, which I think is really beautiful. So this is my first quilt that I was able to complete. Um, and something that I also want to mention is that, um, so I began working on my first quilt in February, and then Thomas City and I began working together virtually um, in March. And when the pandemic became um, a, a big issue, um, one of the things that I started doing you, doing with my quilting skills is to make um, fabric masks. And so this is one of the masks that I made um, using bias tape um, and different fabrics that I have. So this is an all cotton mask and all of the skills that I learned in my first few lessons with Tomasita um, really enabled me to begin making masks for myself and for my family members. And so um, in the early stages of the pandemic, it felt really good to, to be able to have those tools to, to help my family. So I was able to mail masks to um, my father um, and my stepmother in Houston. Um, my mom is a really big sewer. So we actually made our first mask together over FaceTime which is a good way to connect with her during kind of a scary time. And then I was able to make masks for my friends and also for my sister. So um, everything that I needed, I already had. I had fabric, I had thread, I had all of the rulers and the cutting mats and the rotary blades that I needed. And so mask making became kind of a little insert into my apprenticeship um, in March and in April. So. I'm really grateful that I was able to use my quilting skills kind of on the fly to do that, those things. Um, so if I can go back to the slide presentation, please. Thank you. Um, and so one thing that I wanted to mention too is that before uh, my apprenticeship became virtual, um, the last meeting that Thomasita and I had um, in person was actually going to QuiltCon, which is this incredible gathering that happens um, every year at the Austin Convention Center. And it's a conference um, of modern quilters and it's put on by the Modern Quilting Guild. And that was also a really eye-opening opportunity for me to be able to see all of the, all of the different things that you could see with quilts, um, all, the things, all the different things that you can do with quilts. And so um, I was able to buy fabric at QuiltCon. And as Thomasita and I walked around the, the QuiltCon together, it was really a, a great lesson because as we were walking by quilts that looked very complicated, Thomasita would ask me like, oh, do you see the nine patch or do you see the half square triangle? Like you can take very simple quilt, very simple shapes within quilting and make very complex patterns. And so that was um, a really important um, lesson for me and just being able to see how I could begin to improvise with some of the skills that I already had which brings me to the second quilt that I made. Um, and this is a quilt top. So the quilt that I made is the one that's on the right. Um, it's the one that's mostly blue and that um, has uh, the, the large pink kind of border um, around the central piece. 
And this quilt originally, um, when I, you know, I was really interested in learning uh, log cabin, which is what this pattern is called, log cabin, um, or some, sometimes it's also called house top in G's Bend. But the log cabin is uh, one of the most, um, I would say, well-known um, um, quilting patterns that's used by the G's Bend quilters. It's a very simple, um, method using um, strips of fabric and you basically start um, from the center and then you add strips on at different points and it gives you this kind of rhythm of color um, and shapes that's really beautiful and so the inspiration for my quilt is the quilt that's on the left it's the one that has a lot of turquoise in it um, and a lot of green so originally i wanted to recreate this quilt but when I started working on my second quilt is when there were a lot of really um, stressful things going on in the world um, in terms of, you know, how the COVID pandemic was being handled and within um, African-American communities, a lot of the protests were beginning to get started at the time that I began this quilt. And so I decided to veer from the, uh, I decided to veer from the, you know, from doing an exact replica of a G's bin quilt. And my biggest departure was the center block on my quilt, um, which is um, an upside down um, white house using half, and I made this using half square triangles and using um, a strip set with narrow strips of white and then wider strips of navy blue. And this quilt really for me represents a moment when it just seemed like everything was, was very chaotic. Um, and I wanted to represent um, just kind of how I saw things playing out in the world. Um, I really love this quilt, um, not just because of what it means for me and the moment in which I created it, but also because this is the first quilt that I made that incorporates some of my um, hand-dyed indigo. And so I used the indigo as a border around where the red fabric is within the quilt. So that's where you begin to see um, the indigo cloth, which has a little bit more of a, a modeled um, texture. And so, um, yeah, this is a quilt that I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how big I want it to be and what I want the final dimensions to be and also um, what I'm gonna use for the backing cloth. But this is the completed quilt top. So I'm really proud of this piece and it, it really allowed me to explore color and texture and incorporating different hand dyed fabrics that I had just in my own fabric stash. Um, and if you can see the, actually the strip of white that's right below my White House block is a piece of, um, that's a fragment of a hand block printed piece that I made. Um, and so this, this quilt just incorporates a lot of different textures, a lot of different meanings. Um, and I tried to stay true to the palette of um, the G's Bin quilt. So yeah, that's my house top quilt. Um, and if you want to learn more about the G's Bin quilters, um, there's a really great website called, uh, the, there's a, an organization called the Souls Grown Deep Foundation that works with the quilters to license um, images of their quilts. Um, and the G's Bin quilters are hugely influential um, in terms of modern quilting and a lot of the modern um, quilting aesthetics that have developed. So, yes. Um, and I guess one thing I'll mention too is that um, while this is a quilt that I made completely <laughs> when I made this quilt during the time when Thomasita and I were working together virtually, but um, Thomasita, because she's so involved in, in so many different quilting groups, was really great at making sure that I stayed connected to a community of quilters, um, which was really wonderful. So um, I, during the course of my apprenticeship, I joined the um, Austin Area Quilt Guild. I also attended um, virtual meetings. Um, and if you can move to the next slide, um, the third quilt that I made, I actually made this quilt in one weekend um, as part of a workshop with Irene Roddick who's a really wonderful um, improvisational modern quilter. And so I really loved making this quilt. Um, and again, it was really made possible through 
um, you know, my membership in the local quilters guild and being able to sign up for classes to kind of learn different skills. And so um, I love this quilt because this is the first quilt that I made that incorporated curves and curves are really hard to sew <laughs> and to cut. And so I was really happy that I was able to incorporate that into an improvisational quilt. And so I think one of the things that really, that I love about this quilt when I look at it is that I was able to make this quilt, this quilt top in one weekend. So um, the workshop was four hours a day um, over the course of like a Saturday and a Sunday. And I ended up sewing like nine or 10 hours each of those days. So in addition to the time that I spent in the workshop, I spent many hours just figuring out how my quilt was going to fit together. And I love the way that it turned out. Um, and if you'll hold on for one minute, I'll show you what this quilt looks like. So um, again, this is a quilt top. So it hasn't, it doesn't have all of the layers and pieces um, that my first quilt has, but this quilt is one that I'm actually gonna turn into a wall hanging. And if you can see some of the, like this side piece of the quilt is really interesting because the, in these two blocks, I've basically returned to making um, a log cabin. These are mini like strip quilts that I used to edge the quilt that I made. And then these on the bottom, this, these are half square triangles. So I was able to use very simple shapes. Um, at the top here, this is a strip set. And then these are giant curved pieces that I was able to kind of piece together um, using, using a, a technique that's basically very similar to collage. The only difference between this quilt and a paper collage is that when you're sewing something, you have to account for seam allowances. So I cut all of this fabric out, not knowing how it was going to fit together. And then, you know, a lot of the time that I spent sewing it was just really trying to, to think about like, okay, where do I need to fit in an extra piece of cloth or an extra strip of cloth to get the shapes that I want. So yeah, I'm really proud of that one. Um, and um, that the I'm going to continue to work with um, improvisational quilting and also with art quilting. So when at the beginning of my presentation, when I was talking about um, like nine, like you know, half square triangles and nine patch. Those are like quilting blocks. So with that type of quilting, in traditional quilting, you would normally have um, like a series of blocks that you attach together in order to make a really large blanket or wall hanging. In modern quilting, modern quilting is really, to me, this is my interpretation, everybody has a different view, but for me, modern quilting is really about using bigger shapes and kind of going beyond the small blocks to really think about um, having, you know, lines crossing in different ways, using very bold colors. Um, you know, it's something that's more reflective of, of the, the third quilt that I showed. But I think even the, the G's Ben quilts, which are, you know, 50, 80 years old, some of those quilts were made in the 20s and the 30s. A lot of the qualities that you see in a G's Ben quilt are things that you see in modern quilting. Um, and I like that with my apprenticeship, I was able to kind of take this journey through these different styles of quilting and almost like these different eras of quilting in a way. Um, and I really wanna continue that work. And my next quilt is going to be an art quilt. And art quilts are really fun because art quilts begin to incorporate different materials. Some of them have more of a three-dimensional effect. So you begin to get into almost like mixed, well, they are, a lot of them are like mixed media pieces. They might incorporate buttons or metal, um, beads, things like that. And that style of quilting really appeals to me because in addition to working with indigo, I also work with embroidery. Um, and I love doing improvisational embroidery. 
So I really want to incorporate all of these kind of different textile techniques that I love into uh, my art quilt. And so the art quilt that I make, which I have sketched, but I haven't actually started, is also going to be a map. Um, and I'm going to be using a lot of the techniques in this book. Um, and the woman who wrote this book, Valerie Goodwin, she actually taught a workshop last year in Austin that I missed. Um, because I wasn't an, an apprentice last year, but um, she wrote this really great book that talks about incorporating a lot of different materials to kind of build up layers and create street maps using textiles. And so um, in my next quilt, in addition to using kind of a lot of bold colors and lines, I want to begin um, experimenting with different transparencies of fabric. Um, because when you're making a map, you almost have to think about it as like, when you look at a Google map, like how do you tell the difference between what is a street and what is a sidewalk? Um, in Google, those are very subtle color changes, but in the quilting world, sometimes the best way to represent a subtle color change is actually by adding like a layer of gauze over something um, to build up dimensionality. Um, and so I'm excited to start that next project. Um, and if you'll go to the next slide, please. Um, and so for me, in terms of what's next for my work, um, I love everything that I've learned with quilting and I definitely plan to continue it. Um, and so this is, um, one piece, this is a print piece on paper that I created as part of my Holding Ground series. Um, which is looking at um, African-American freedmen settlements in Austin. And so I've licensed images from the Austin History Center um, and I'm incorporating, I'm bringing together um, natural elements with historic images. And so even though I made this image, I made this image in December of 2019, when I look at it now, it really reminds me of a quilt because I created this image by laying down um, a historic image and overlaying um, pecan leaves, um, like just leaves from a pecan tree and arranging them over this image. And so this is the kind of effect that I would really love to experiment with um, in textiles and in fabric. Um, and so my, my art quilt is actually going to be a map that kind of bring some context to these prints that I've made for my Holding Ground project. And the other thing that I've been working on while I've been quilting is continuing to learn different dyeing techniques um, that I can bring into my quilting practice. And so um, I actually took a mud, a mineral mud dyeing class um, recently with an artist from Mali and it was a virtual workshop, but I ended up with a lot of pieces. Um, I love this one. This one's hand woven. Um, I want to learn how to weave at some point, but this is a piece of um, hand woven cotton from Molly. And then over it, I've created um, a pattern with mud. Um, and so I ended up, I deliberately in the workshop created these kind of long strips of fabric that I want to incorporate into a quilt. Um, and so I created different patterns, thinking a lot about um, things like crossroads and also thinking about um, the corner pieces of a quilt. And so I'll either use this as a strip set for my next quilt, or I might actually cut these individual um, crosses into squares and use them as the, uh, the edge as the corner pieces for a quilt. So this is kind of what I've been working on next. Um, so I have a lot of ideas percolating and a lot of different fabrics <laughs> that I'm excited to incorporate um, into my next series of quilts. And I guess um, in addition to the map quilt, I'm also going to be making a quilt um, as part of a group show that's focusing on black suffragettes. And so to, and the, the show is meant to mark the occasion of, um, you know, women getting the right to vote. Um, Cause that's the anniversary year that we're in for that moment. 
So the suffragette that I chose is Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer was um, a civil rights activist um, who spoke at the, oh my gosh, I hope I get the year right. I wanna say the 1964 Democratic Convention in Atlantic City. And so at the time that she spoke, even though um, some women had the right to vote, um, black women in the South still didn't have the right to vote. And so she isn't maybe a traditional suffragette, but she was definitely very active in working for voting rights. And so I'm excited to use some of the techniques that I've, I've learned to try and bring her to life. Um, and I'll be incorporating, um, a, trying to like, I'm basically gonna be using a photograph of Fannie Lou Hamer as the centerpiece of my quilt and then creating different elements around it that speak to the work that she did um, in securing uh, the right to vote for people during the civil rights movement. So yes, so I'm really excited about everything that I learned in my apprenticeship. And I wanna thank Texas Folklife um, again, because being able to get the funding to learn quilting was kind of a dream come true. Um, just being able to really focus on one skill that that really meshed so well with all of the other things that I love doing. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer, for a great presentation. And that was something I was gonna comment on here. Um, one, it was so interesting to see your growth as, as a quilter, but then seeing how that informed and was informed by your existing practices as, as a textile artist and researcher um, and how it all is, is, I think, coming together so nicely um, in, in such a powerful way. I have a quick question about your notion of improvisation. Um, yes. If you can speak a little bit more about what that means to to um, create an improv, you know, an improvised quilt. You know, I'm speaking from my experience as a musician, where you can spend a lot of time in a practice room, um, like learning phrases or licks or ideas, and then you know, in the course of performance, as we heard Strinity do, you you, you rely on kind of these uh, building blocks that you have built in the past, but they kind of happen like that. So. <laughs> But quilting, I'm imagining that the process of improvisation is a more drawn out uh, process, I'm assuming. Um, I don't I don't think so. I think that hmm. that's actually I think like that method is is very relevant for quilting because when I created um, my improvisational quilt, I had a design wall um, because I was taking a class and I was learning a technique. Um, Irene Roddick, who taught the class, she basically told us to buy two contrasting colors of fabric mm -hmm. and bring them to the class. Mm -hmm. And I chose three and I kind of had an, an idea. I mean, one of the reasons I chose the like the dark maroon and the bright magenta and the yellow is because those are colors I never work with. I always mm -hmm. work with blue. <laughs> so I wanted to push myself to work with things that were outside of my normal palette. And I had no idea what I was going to make when I bought those things. So it was basically, I mean, it's similar to like learning a scale, like mm -hmm. within music, like once you have the scale, you can then kind of veer off. Uh -huh. And so I think in improvisational quilting, my foundation was, you know, having an understanding of color theory. And one of the books that Thomasita lent me is this really great, um, color theory book for quilters called uh -huh. Color Play. And it talks about how different colors can create different effects against mm -hmm. each other. And so the setting sun was the inspiration for my improvisational quilt. And so I started to think about how the sun looks when it's like setting and you see it through trees. So I was really thinking about shadows and light and how to bring those like moments of brightness into the quilt. Um, and so, I mean, I think the fact that I created it in two days, I'm still kind of amazed that I was able to do that. But making something in two days is a super fast way of working for a quilter. Because mm, mm. how long normally would it, you know, the, your nine patch quilt? Yeah, I mean, my first quilt, so I, I have gotten faster. My first quilt, I started in February and I finished, I finished binding it um, two weeks ago. Mm. So several months for my first quilt, but again, I was making like those little blocks and having to piece them together. Yeah. The log cabin quilt took me, I want to say a month and a half, two months to make that quilt top. 
So um, it's really fun to work really quickly and to work in an improvisational way because it's like I didn't know what I was going to get at the end of it. And with the yeah. first two quilts, I had kind of a map in my head of where yeah. I wanted to end up. Well, that's great. I mean, I, I agree. I think it turned out wonderfully. It was a very exciting piece. Um, and that was something I had in the back of my mind was thinking like, this is not blue. This is, these are just yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, and it's funny cause I bought, I bought the dark magenta fabric and, or I, yeah, I bought the like maroon fabric and the magenta fabric first. And then I freaked out a little bit and had to go back <laughs> to the fabric store. Cause I was like, wait, what have I done? So, <laughs> yeah. Um, but that was a really fun quilt to make. And it was a fun way of working. Um, especially it was like, it's, I think with quilters, one thing I've learned is that like quilters all have like a fabric stash and we all have our favorite fabrics. And so mm. there are fabrics that I have that I'm like, I know that I don't have the skill yet to use them because I, I want to save them for something really good. Mm. So it was nice it felt really low pressure to just buy fabric for that glass and just right. cut it up and play with it. Cause it wasn't like my precious indigo cloth or something. Definitely. Um, yeah. well, great. We have a, a question here from, from Charlie Lockwood. Um, and, and he's wanting to know if you can speak more about the quilt of G's Benz and you know, how that inspired you. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the G's Ben quilters are like, they're legends. They're legends within the quilting world. I, I don't, I've also been watching a lot of quilting videos and um, there's like a great series called Craft in America um, that has, you know, they have a whole quilting show that features the G's Ben quilters. So those, those women were, are really inspiring to me because they created art. I mean, hmm. the, one of the, the ways that they became famous is that um, their quilts were displayed, I want to say at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, because the quilts reminded people so much of modernist painters. Um, you know, some of the quilts reminded people of like a Rothko. Like if you've been to like the Rothko Chapel in Houston, you know, Rothko is famous for using, for having like color field paintings where you might have, you know, only two colors in the painting, or you might have a gradation of one color within a painting. Mm -hmm. And the, the G's Ben quilters were shown in an art museum at a time when people weren't thinking about quilts as fine art. Hmm. And so that show really helped turn a corner for how people thought about quilts. And they kind of, their, their work really helped bridge a gap between like folk art and fine art. Hmm. Um, and so their, the way that those quilts like the way that they were, and so I think that's really inspiring, the fact that they've been able to like gain so much respect mm -hmm. in so many different, like across genres, like in craft, in folk art, and in fine art. But then I'm also really inspired by how the quilts were made. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the quilts, like one of my most favorite quilts, which I don't have a picture of, but a lot of the quilts incorporate um, uh, fabric from work clothes. So there's a woman who made an entire quilt out of her husband's old like um, coveralls and jeans. Wow. And the wear patterns on the jeans, like you can really tell that it's like lived in fa fabric. And the way that that creates like a dimension, uh, it creates like dimensions within the work because you have bright blues, you have light blues. Um, it's just really beautiful. So um, when I first started working with Indigo, I would look at the G's Ben quilts to think about what kind of blue I wanted to get out of my Indigo. Um, hmm. And so the way that they were able to use work clothes was really inspiring for me. Um, and I think, you know, in thinking about like this, like the political moment that we're in, I really wanted to meld those two things together because for me, the G's Ben quilters, it's like, their, their story is a story of like how people thrive, how people create home mm. um, when they don't have a lot of money, but they're mm. still very rich in the knowledge that they have and the way that they're able to like use what they have. They're creating art out of fabric that a lot of people just would have thrown away. Mm. So I think that's really important in um, the African-American quilting traditions. And um, it also, for me, when I was making that quilt, you know, it's like we're in a pandemic, there's political um, uprisings. And so 
I was thinking a lot about like, okay, like what does the future look like? And so it's kind of comforting to think back on how people were able to survive in beautiful ways. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, that's wonderful, wonderful answer. And yeah, I mean, it, it's making me think too, just about uh, another, just the importance of community in, in a practice that can seemingly be long stretches of very solitary work. Um, yeah. in many cases, right? But still, this is a uh, community is, is really sort of stitched in and, and so many different ways. Yeah, definitely. I mean, in the way that the G's been quilters, like traditionally, they would all work. I mean, in a, a lot of quilts were made, most quilts were made this way. It's like you might have one person who made a quilt top, but then the actual quilting of those layers of fabric together, that was a communal activity. Um, and so one of the things I would love to do, I've been like dreaming of doing a workshop that focuses on the actual quilting and not just the piecework ah, that people see the on process. the top. Because the quilt, the quilting is actually the communal activity. So I love the idea of like at some point being able to like buy a quilting frame and do a workshop that kind of meshes like quilting techniques with embroidery. Because wow. um, you can create really beautiful things even if you have um, a solid piece of fabric. Well, that sounds wonderful. I, I look forward to this workshop. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to having it one day soon. <laughs> Great, Jennifer, um, thank you again for this wonderful presentation. And um, yeah, I know I am personally very excited to see you know, your future work. It sounds like you have a lot of really awesome and exciting projects um, that are under works right now. So looking forward to see more, more of your work. Yeah, thank you. And thank you so much for the opportunity too. It's really like from the time that I saw the quilting show um, in the gallery to now, it's been like a really great experience. So um, yeah, thank you guys for the work that you do. Sure, thank you. Um, well, um, there we have it. That is the end of part two. So we've had two wonderful evenings of um, fantastic presentations by wonderful artists. So again, yeah, just one final thank you to each of the artists who presented tonight and last Thursday. Um, and I've, again, really enjoyed getting to know everyone and learning about all of the uh, current cohorts um, work over the course of, of the apprenticeship program. Uh, quick thank you to Ben Doyle of Bend Productions for his technical assistance during um, tonight's and last week's broadcasts. We are very thankful for the, the very slick production quality. Um, pretty awesome. Uh, thank you again to all of you who tuned in tonight. So, yes, please have a great evening and stay safe.